Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. Every American can profit by the successful NFO collective bargaining program for agriculture, for farm income sets the nation's prosperity. U.S. Farm Report presents a look at agriculture and the economy with some of the, some of the top leaders of our nation's capital. I have today a special guest. I should tell you maybe that I'm W.W. W. Butch Swain, Public Information uh, Director of the National Farmers Organization at Corning, Iowa. Today it gives me great pleasure, the guest that I have here, Senator Paul Douglas of Illinois, who has been in the United States Senate since 1949 and has served on powerful Senate committees, banking and currency, finance and economic matters. Also, from the National Farmers Organization, Leonard Cramp, our national president, or I mean our state president in Illinois. During the recent National Farmers Organization excursion to Washington, when over 400 congressional district and state and national leaders visit their congressmen and senators in Washington, the president of the Illinois, Mr. Leonard Cramp, uh, discussed some of the farmers' problems with Senator Douglas of Illinois. The program which follows is a televised recording of their visit. And Senator Douglas, we're certainly glad to have you on this program because we know that you've done an outstanding job in the Senate, and this we appreciate. And Leonard Cramp, we know that you're doing an outstanding job in the state of Illinois. If you fellows will discuss the farm situation, I'm sure that everyone in the nation can be much better informed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Butch. Senator? It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'm quite proud of this uh, situation that I'm in. I'm going to get right into some important questions. That's fine. Uh, first of all, Senator Douglas, uh, you serve on the banking and currency finance and joint economic committees for the Senate. And I'm sure you're familiar with the high interest rate situation. Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> well, farmers, uh, because of this, are in a cost price squeeze. And one of the serious aspects of that problem is interest rates. It takes a lot of capital to farm these days. Uh, loans are increasingly expensive, whether it comes from private resources or some of the government lending agencies. Uh, some uh, loaning agencies, in fact, are pretty well loaned up, and this is becoming a serious problem. Is anything being done or contemplated to reduce the high cost of loans, to get this interest rate down? Well, we're trying to uh, keep interest rates down, but I don't think our efforts have been as successful as they should have been. I think we've depended too much on what is termed uh, monetary policy to check the so-called increase in prices. And uh, therefore, the Federal Reserve Board has tried to uh, raise interest rates in the belief, which is probably true, that it will reduce borrowing. And I think uh, it has checked uh, many, and is checking, many proper business forms of expansion. Uh, I would like to see us use more emphasis on uh, fiscal policy and uh, do two things. First, eliminate some unnecessary expenditures, uh, not in the poverty program, not in the welfare programs, but I don't think we need uh, a supersonic air transport at this time, and I would rather improve conditions on Earth than send a man to the moon and back. We could save two or three billion dollars right there each year. And then in addition, I would plug some of the terrible loopholes in our system of taxation. For example, there are about 30 people in the United States every year, not necessarily the same people, who have incomes over $500,000 but never pay a cent in taxes. And this is because uh, they have uh, tailor-made loopholes. The 27 half depletion allowance on oil, the fact that they can write off all of their investment in virtually the first year, or at least 90% of it. The uh, capital gains uh, tax, which uh, is very weak. And of course, stock options for uh, business executives at only about half normal rate of taxation, plus the abuse of, of uh, foundations. So that in my judgment, uh, we could uh, balance the budget by eliminating some of these unnecessary expenditures. And, I, and I, I'm not for cutting the expenditures on education, health, and welfare. 
uh, and also plugging the loopholes in taxation. And this uh, uh, would have a stabilizing influence on prices, and it wouldn't be necessary to increase interest rates as much as the Federal Reserve Board is doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If I may add one thing, we, uh, the increase in prices has been perhaps greatest in the field of metals and machinery. And we passed a few years ago a 7% uh, investment credit, which is really a 14% reduction in taxes, because 7% uh, absolutes are about 14% of the 48% corporate tax. And we've been rewarding investment. And uh, this uh, a tremendous rush uh, of uh, investment has driven up the price of machinery and metals. So I would repeal that 7% investment credit very quickly also. Well, thank you, <coughs> Senator. Uh, this leads me to uh, another question. Uh, our big city newspapers, uh, they contain a great deal right now about rising milk and bread prices. But uh, only a little bit about the way farm production costs are going yes. up. Yes. I noticed one story that said farm costs have gone up 8% while farmers' prices were rising 4%. Now, inflation always hurts farmers. Costs go up earlier and faster than our prices. Shouldn't more be done to control this cost inflation and loosen up the cost price squeeze on the farmers and other people? Come? Well, as I've indicated, I think if we uh, repeal the investment credit, there wouldn't be as much uh, competition for machinery and metals. The uh, corporations are putting in enormous amounts of fixed capital and uh, uh, because they're getting a, what amounts to a 14% reduction in their tax scales. Uh, if this were eliminated, uh, then the supply of metals could be used in a larger degree to meet the farmer's need for machinery, and you wouldn't have the price increases in the price of tractors and other farm implements that we're now getting. Well, uh, if I may uh, come back yes. to that, however, Mr. Kraft, uh, there's a lot of exaggeration about the part which uh, farm prices play in the increase in the cost of living in the cities. I think I'm right in saying that a, uh, a 20 cent loaf of bread has only about two and a half cents of wheat in it. And yet all too often an increase in the price of wheat, which has occurred, is blamed as the cause for the increase in the price of bread. And similarly, uh, with milk, let us say, selling at 24 cents a quart, the dairy farmer in my region uh, gets only, is it six and a half or seven cents? Uh, six and a half. Six and a half cents yes, a quart. In, in and so that's, that's only one quarter of the price. I've always felt that the middlemen have absorbed uh, too great a share. Now, they will excuse themselves and say that the cost of processing is high, cost of packaging is high, cost of distribution is high. But uh, something seems to be wrong if uh, nine-tenths of the price of uh, uh, bread goes for substances other than wheat and uh, services other than those of the farmer and uh, three-quarters of the price of milk. Yes, I remember, Senator, a uh, $105 increase in the per capita expenditure for food. 104 of these went to the middleman, and only $1 went to the farmer. In recent years? Yes. yes. I uh, l would like to interject a little thought here for the consuming public, and I've used this example many times. I've gotten into discussions with um, city people, and so I refer them to their Saturday grocery cart. Yes. And they complain about high food prices. So I said, I say this, come Saturday when you come out of the store and pay your 20 or $25 for your week's supply of groceries. When you get home, set over here all the food, actual food. Set over here the cigarettes, the tin foil, the nylon hose, and everything that you buy in the supermarket today, and then see how much your grocery basket is. Yes. Well, of course, there's an effort being made to uh, set the farmers and city people against each other. Correct. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, cards and sheets being circulated uh, showing the increase in the price of pork chops and bacon and uh, bread and milk and so forth. And the implication is that the farmers are guilty of this. On the other hand, uh, farm people are being told that the uh, cost of machinery and uh, the things that they buy are up because of the wages of the city workers. 
And uh, so a double game is played to uh, split the two groups apart. And uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we need to keep the general price level down, but allow within that general price level uh, individual prices to move rather freely according to the quantities uh, supplied and the intensity of demand. And uh, what is happening, of course, is that the uh, surpluses of the grains, which were formerly very large, have been diminishing. I've got some figures here. 1960, the uh, supply of corn amounted to almost a billion and a half bushels. And um, now it's down to, well, I, pardon me, that should be in terms of dollars, almost a billion and a half dollars worth of corn. Now it's down to less than 400 million. Supply of wheat was a, uh, a billion, 100 million. Now it's down to 400 million. Soybeans, uh, supply of soybeans, storage of soy soybeans, virtually non-existent. So that the farm surpluses have disappeared largely. Uh, people ha in the cities have more income, and as you say, uh, spending more on food. This naturally will send up the price of food. And in addition to this, we've embarked, and I th think justifiably so, on a world campaign against starvation and hunger. And so that there's a greater demand for, uh, for food, and we should be grateful for the productivity of American agriculture. The farmer simply should get a larger share. The big uh, surplus, of course, is on cotton. And uh, cotton had about a $5 billion surplus in uh, uh, 1960. N that is almost double, oh, that's in terms of bales. About um, uh, 5, million male, uh, 5 million bales and now over 9 million bales. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, cotton uh, supply has gone up, but the total amount of dollars in farm surpluses are much lower. Oh, yes. They're the way down. Amount. This is a real important point. Yes, the total supply uh, in terms of dollars is only about one half what it was in 1960, though the uh, uh, reserve of cotton has almost doubled. In fact, it's the cotton reserve which is largely uh, uh, responsible for the, the dollar surplus now, not the reserves of corn, wheat, or soybeans. This is correct. Uh, cotton, too, incidentally, is actually, well, there are some uh, feed grain byproducts of cotton, but yeah. cotton is more or less a product to use for textiles. That's and, right. Uh, uh, we're talking in the other columns about food, and uh, food is the most important commodity in the world. You show me a person that can't use food, and I'll show you a dead man. Well. And uh, most of the, wo uh, the world could use much more food. This is correct. correct. Uh, because I suppose ha close to half the population of the world is so seriously underfed as to suffer from what is known as malnutrition. Many people in this country that don't have the proper diet either. That is correct. If that they had the correct. proper diet, uh, our statistics show that we would immediately use 10% more food in this country. Well, now this, had a proper diet. now this is very important, and this proper diet may be in part the uh, result of ignorance, but in part it's the result of poverty. And if we could uh, eliminate poverty in the country, uh, then the demand for food would go up and the farmers would prosper. And that is why I've always said that the interests of the uh, workers in the cities and the interests of those in the country are fundamentally uh, similar, mm -hmm. that one benefits from the other. Nothing would alleviate poverty like restoring fair farm prices all the way across the well, that would help. Yes, that would help the small farmer, but also well, we've got city poor too, you remember. Uh, it, uh, this is true, but this would add more money to our economy at the base, and it would generate more income all along the line, and the other people profit by it in this way, and this is quite often overlooked. Uh, by people in this country. Well, it, is, it is true, I think, that rural poverty is probably uh, greater in physical volume than urban poverty. Uh, the people in the Appalachians, the people on the small farms, the people up at the end of the dirt road, so to speak. But there's a lot of city poverty, too. And one of the things I've liked about you and uh, liked about uh, another farm organization is that uh, you're not merely considering the farmers, you also consider 
society, right. and you're concerned with the right. poor people wherever they are, uh, not merely those on the farm. Very much so, and I think this is the way it should be. Our concern should be for people, not just for one group of that people. That is right. Very, very good, <laughs> Senator Douglas. This uh, leads me to another important question that I have here, and uh, it's rather lengthy, but uh, if you'll bear with me, oh. I'll try to get it out properly. Uh, I'm sure you uh, will, Mr. Crabb. According to the Department of Agriculture, about 90,000 farms go out of existence every year. Now, the number of farms in this country is now less than half of the 6,800,000 that existed in 1935. The NFO believes in family-type farming but we see increasing con concentration of agriculture in huge farming operations. I noticed you voted the other day for a limit on the amount of benefits from farm programs going to a single farmer. I certainly did, and I thought but that... But the limitation was defeated. Yes, I thought that uh, the government and the taxpayer should not pay more than $50,000 to uh, an individual farmer. And I thought that this was going to be passed. I think we only got a handful of votes. This is a scandal, Mr. Kraft, a scandal. I agree with And the uh, uh, farm program primarily helps the, the farmers who don't need much help. Another thing, too, in the, in the money that's charged up to agriculture, statistics shows, and I think you'll bear me out in this, Senator Douglas, that, that out of each dollar appropriated for farm programs, that about two dollars of this goes for the public and only about a dollar or maybe even less than a dollar actually helps the farmer. Well, this is a thing that the public is misled in. There's a good deal of padding. Now if I may come back to this elimination of the small farm a minute, uh, I've always felt that we should try to preserve the small farm and uh, I felt that we should foster uh, off farm income for one thing, particularly in uh, the winter months. But I've also wondered why it is that farmers, small farmers, could not combine together to buy and use farm machinery. Now, I've been traveling through uh, western Illinois and spent a day in Rock Island, where they make most of the farm implements. And uh, <clears throat> the modern tractor j tends to be a huge affair modern corn picker, the uh, uh, reaper. Uh, farm machinery is getting so, and the uh, modern plow, uh, is getting so costly that a small farmer can't buy this machinery. And why couldn't uh, a number of farmers go in together through the NFO and uh, buy the machinery and then use it in rotation? Now, I know there'll be quarrels as to who is to uh, first. plow first, but uh, this is too expensive for any one person. It's not too expensive for 10 or 15 together. Keep the, keep the machinery busy. Keep it busy. As a matter of fact, I think most farms are over-machined over anyway. Uh, you'll see this, uh, this machinery lying idle, in, uh, either under shelter or in some cases lying out in the rain. Uh, couldn't you get your people to cooperate together to uh, buy the machinery and use it cooperatively? They do I, I think we're doing this in many, many cases, right. Senator, but th there's another even more serious aspect. This is new machinery that we're talking about, big yeah. giants. Yeah. Uh, the farm implement dealers are now becoming quite concerned. I've been talking to several of them in the last six months, and uh, they now have bigger operations, uh, these uh, corporate-type structures who are buying this big machinery, uh, they use it for four or five years, and they're turning it in on trade. The implement dealers have no place to even go with this used equipment. The average farmer can't even buy this equipment on a used basis. It's become that serious. I uh, didn't get my question finished a while Excuse ago, and I'm, I'm going to go on. Excuse me. Uh, on some thoughts that we have on uh, this situation. Uh, we think vertical integration in agriculture by the chain stores and the packers should be forbidden. Uh, that they shouldn't be allowed to get into livestock feeding and farming operations. Uh, what are your views on, well, you've given some of them, and maybe we can go into this a little further, on the family-type agriculture, and how can we best promote it? Well, I'm certainly, I believe in farming as a way of life, although I know that the enthusiasm for this tends to be greater among city dwellers who grew up in the country <laughs> than it is for uh, farm boys and girls. 
But uh, on this question of uh, so-called integrated farming, this has gone farthest, I suppose, in the, in the poultry field. Yes. Uh, poultry and eggs. And uh, in many cases now, the poultry farmer <coughs> is, is just a piece worker uh, being given uh, uh, the chickens, being given a feed, and then uh, uh, held down pretty closely on, on price. I, I regret this, and I would favor, I would be willing to say that uh, you should have independent ownership of poultry farms and of uh, uh, cattle feeding operations and um, uh, farming itself. No doubt about it, it was the family farm structure of agriculture that made the United States of America the greatest nation in the world, and it will continue to make it this way. But if this is allowed to deteriorate, as you pointed out, and go to a corporate structure, you're going to lose undoubtedly, at least the livestock industry of hogs and cattle. And this is a serious blow because when you lose these, you're losing a great force of free labor. Because whether you think of this or not, hogs and cattle produce food. In other words, they're a factory within themselves that turn products that we can't consume that are going to waste in our nation into food that people can eat. And if we go to a corporate type agriculture, which they have in some sections of the world, you're going to lose this production of livestock animals, well, you a know, great source of food. I uh, once spent a day going through the Central Valley of California, where you have uh, corporate uh, farming carried to an extreme. And I remember going into uh, uh, one town where, which was surrounded by small family-sized farms. They had independent merchants, uh, doctors, lawyers, churches, uh, a thriving local newspaper, political discussions, fraternal organizations, uh, a live uh, American town. And then there was another town, which was a uh, trading center for a huge uh, 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 farm of, uh, oh, I think something like 25,000 acres. And the people there were Mexican-Americans, nice people. But the only stores were, there were three stores. One, a, a tavern. <laughs> One, uh, a cheap grocery store. Another, a store where you could buy uh, uh, overalls <laughs> and rough clothing. That was it. Mm -hmm. The streets were unpaved. Uh, the people were serfs. And uh, there's no question as to which type was, was the healthier. And I would favor California and New Mexico and Arizona probably are the worst in this respect because they have the old Mexican mm -hmm. uh, land system plus the railway grants. But uh, it's developing too much, even in our own Illinois, uh, you get uh, uh, people that own enormous quantities of land and then will have tenants. We had this situation just occur in my particular area, and I won't mention the specific town, but. Uh, 6,000 acres went under the block one day near a small town and uh, seven or eight tenant farmers, each one of these fellows farming eight and 900 acres, got their walking papers overnight. Uh, now the people that have taken over this extensive amount of land no longer will buy, just as you say, in that local community. They will be dealing directly with the factories. And this is a shocking situation and I want to tell of a little experience I had, which emphasizes your point very clearly. I had the great privilege of accompanying Governor Kerner of Illinois on the trade mission to the Far East last fall, and one of the biggest impacts that I got on the mission was in Japan, and especially in Formosa, where Japan, after the war, came back, and they broke up the large land holdings, put it down into the hands of the family-sized farmers, two and a half, five, ten acres in that case, and Formosa, the same thing under Chiang Kai-shek, with American aid and advice. Uh, we did this, and I think as of a year ago, Formosa went off of American aid. That is right. They are now producing enough food to feed their people and have a little for export. So I think it really emphasizes your point very well, which you did a terrific job of. Well, of course, that should be accompanied by the use of modern machinery. We shouldn't go back to uh, a horse. <laughs> Right. Uh, horse plow and uh, ordinary rake and so forth and so on. But uh, again, I want to stress, if I may, <coughs> uh, 
getting your members to join together for the cooperative purchase and use of farm machinery. There would only be one objection to this, Senator. Our bylaws state that we're organizing for one purpose, and this is to join together to bargain for the sale of the of our production yes. and to get a price. Now, this would be fine on an individual basis, but as an organization as such, we would be prohibited from this. I see, gentlemen, our time is about up. Mr. Cramp, do you have any more quick questions? Well, I have one like quick question you? here, and I wanted to ask you if you, uh, you may have to break in and cut us off. Do you think consumers are being honestly told the reason for food price increases? We think that farmers are getting blamed for a whole lot of increases that never get into our pocketbooks. Now, we went into this a little bit well, before. Like well, I think that's true. You take the recent increases, uh, the price of food at the grocery store, they've been accompanied by decreases in the wholesale price of food in the markets. In other words, the um, uh, wholesale price has been turning down a food product slightly, and the uh, retail price has been turning up. Well, take this simple figure, which I think is true, that the average income of a man on the farm is only about 55% what the income of a man uh, in the cities actually right. is. And while there are added costs of living in the city, which are not present on the farm, there is too great a disparity. Now, there's less of a disparity than there was uh, six or ten years ago, but it's still too great. This is absolutely right. Gentlemen, our time is nearly up. We're going to have to bring this to a close, and Senator Douglas, it's certainly been a pleasure it's been to interview here, you here today and have you on this program. Well, it's good to be with you. And I know that your heart's in the right place for the family farm structure of agriculture. And Mr. Cramp, I certainly do appreciate this opportunity to visit with you again Senator, and have you on our program. And family farm structure of agriculture is the thing, the backbone of America, the thing that will keep America prosperous. The U.S. Farm Report today has presented a look at agriculture with one of the nation's top leaders in our nation's capital. Now, the Congress of the United States was looking ahead years ago. When they passed the Kappa Volstead Act in 1922, they foresaw today's problems that would be in agriculture. It is up to the farmers of America and leaders such as Senator Douglas to bring out the facts and show people the way to a better way of life in family farm structure of agriculture because our nation's economy still depends on agriculture. Agriculture is still the number one industry with $237 billion invested, which is around two-thirds of all investment of all corporate structures in our nation. So let's keep family farm agriculture in America. Let's band together as farmers to get a price based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit through the NFO collective bargaining program. Thank you for listening.